our first lady, Sister Emily Anderson. Amen. She, she is a working first lady. Amen. She don't just look good. She just work hard, too. So we thank the Lord for her. And, and I tell many ministers, I don't know how these guys minister without having a wife that's in ministry and helping you out like that because that's a blessing to me. Take a lot off my plate. And I know it's somebody you can trust, you know. So I just, I just thank God for her so very much. I tell her that also in private. Not just, <laughs> not just showing off, you know what I'm talking about. All right, if you will, turn your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter number 10. And we're going to look at the first two verses. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. It says, and we're looking at, I'm reading from the New King James Version, so you can, uh, whatever version you have, it will, might sound different, but it'll probably mean the same thing. It says, after these things, the Lord anointed 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and everywhere he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. My topic today is, if not us, then who? Wow. Okay. If not now, when? You may have your seat because the harvest is still plentiful. And, and when we pray for the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers, we need to be willing to be one of them. Like Isaiah say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Because sometimes you're the only Bible somebody might read, you're the only epistle that they might be aware of. Your life might be the only testimony that they have before they go over into eternity. So Jesus in the scripture, he anointed 70 disciples, those he had trained and those he had taught the word of God concerning the kingdom of God. And then he sent them out to carry the word. He told them, whoever hears you, hears me. And whoever reject you, reject me. And whoever reject me, rejects him that sent me. So your voice sometimes is the only one. I thank the Lord for like Sister Roberts with the, the Facebook uh, ministry that she have and Sister uh, Mike. Murphy <laughs> with the ministry that she have and with what our youth groups are doing, uh, what Sister Ann and the good ones did. We are, we're carrying that word out. And sometimes I see Sister Alicia on the uh, internet giving a word. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to carry that. And there are people that will listen to you that won't listen to me. Amen. See, And so there are people that are listening to somebody else, but you are the one that they need to bring that word of God to them. And by the way, I want to give accolades to uh, Brother Roxland there. He and I go on the, four, on the second Saturday to the nursing home in Alma. And those people be looking for us. They be expecting. Uh, I went there, I was about, well, actually, not last, not this month, last time, but the time before that, we were supposed to be there at 3 o'clock. I got there at 5 minutes to 3, and they already had a chapel with a lot of people in the chapel waiting on, <laughs> waiting on me to show up. And Brother Roxon was already there. They have a hunger for the word of God. Yeah. And let me tell you, just because somebody old don't mean they're saved. Right. Amen. 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 And, and you can give a testimony to God. And Brother Roxon always, they love to hear him sing. Amen. And he'll sing a song and then he'll uh, give them the word. And so, and we pray for the people. That one lady um, asked me to she said, I got pain in my back, so pray for my back. We prayed for her back. Then the next time we went back, I said, how are your back doing? She said, my back doing all right, and I pray for my legs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the word is working. And the last time, I'm excited about it. The last time we went there, this lady said, pray for my eyes. And so we gave her the word of God. And we laid hands on her, and we prayed for her eyes, 
and I'm believe and gave her the right testimony to give. So when we go back, I'm looking for a, a praise report from her because God still healed. Amen. Amen. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the things that he did when he walked here on the earth, he still do those things. Amen. But he do them through the body of Christ. He do them through the believers. And so we have to believe the people of God that God sin and have faith in them even as though they even as though they were Christ. Because Paul said we come to you in Christ's stead in his place. In other words, we don't represent ourselves, but we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus sent his disciples out to give the word of God. And now we too are disciples of Christ. And that great commission that Jesus gave to that 120 that were in the upper room and waited on the baptism and the Holy Ghost, that same commission is given to us today. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He let them know when you preach the word of God, some people are going to believe it and get saved. Some people are, going to not, are not going to believe it, but that is not your job to make people believe. Amen. Your job is to give it to them. Amen. Now what they do with the word after you give them, you pray that the Holy Spirit will take that word and make it meaningful to them because it's the, the Bible says no man can come except the Holy Spirit draw him. See, and so we just pray for them that the Holy Spirit will draw them, that the word will go into their heart and help change their lives. But it's not our job to try to make anybody change. Amen. And I was meditating on this this morning and I was thinking about when you talk to, you got friends, but you're reluctant about talking to them about being saved because of their lifestyle. So you're reluctant to talk about them, afraid that they might try to make mockery of you or that they might not receive what you say. But you don't know. Somebody might get mad with you because you talked to them about Jesus, but somebody might get saved. Amen. Amen. So it's your job to tell people about Christ. It's not your job to try to nag them and every time they turn around. I had, <laughs> I had one friend of mine, he lived uh, down the road from me. It's been several years ago. And um, I was walking down from my house to his house. He was out there raking yards. And I talk, we had a conversation, and later on, after he got saved, he told me, he said, when I saw you coming down that road, I said, here he come again. <laughs> but you know what? He's a mighty man of God now. He's saved, he loved God, yeah. but somebody needs to sow a seed. Yeah. See, it's your job to sow the seed, and it's God's job to produce the harvest. Yeah. See, so but the, there's no harvest where there's no seed sown. And so it's our job to do that. And just as the harvest was great back then, people that needed to be saved and hear the word of God is the same thing today. And the only hope of salvation, the only hope for deliverance in this whole world today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He arose on the third day for your justification. He sent back the Holy Spirit to empower us to be able to be ministers of the gospel and do what he assigned us to do. A lot of churches are not being successful because they're not doing what God told them to do, and they're not doing it because they don't have the ability to do it. Every time God gives you an assignment, every time God gives you a vision, it's bigger than you. You need him to help you do it. And if you can do it by yourself, it probably didn't come from God. Amen. Because God always make it too big for you. The Bible says we are workers together with Christ. See, we don't work for him. We work with him. Anytime you think you're working for him, then you're on the wrong track. But everything that you do, it needs to be orchestrated by him, and then you need to work with him in the earth to accomplish his purpose. Amen. Amen. Turn to the book of Isaiah, if you will, chapter number 5. Because I'm, I'm just about to change the flavor just a little bit. And when I get through with this, I hope nobody mad with me. But if you do, I think you'll be all right. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 20. All right. This is the prophet. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. 
What does that woe mean? It's a warning, right? It's a warning to them that call evil good. If God says it's evil, then it's evil. Amen. And if God says it's good, it's good. Amen. If God says it's evil and you call it good, then the Bible says woe unto you. It's a warning. Then he says, who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? So what he is doing, he is telling us that it is be t telling us to beware of liars. If it's good and they call it evil, and it's evil because they're telling it good, the Bible says, let every man be a liar. I was telling many Bible students we got him. Every man be a liar and God's word be true. So if somebody tell you that good is evil and evil is good, that means they are that means they're a liar. Amen. So I just want to throw this at you. And like I say, I ain't trying to make nobody mad, but I'm just trying to prove a point. In the four years that President Donald Trump was president, Washington Post say that he told 30,573 false and misleading statements. I didn't say 3,000. It said 30,000. In his four years, he told 30,573 false or misleading statements. During the presidential debate that he had last week, or back maybe two or three weeks ago, the debate lasted 90 minutes, and he told 30 lies <laughs> in 90 minutes. Joe Biden told nine lies in 30 minutes. President Biden did a 17-minute interview on May 19th with CNN. In the 17 minutes of the interview, they say he told 15 lies. Now, <laughs> Now, 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 if you watched the debate, you would see that both of them consistently call each other liars, and they were right. <laughs> both of them. And I think, this is a Nathaniel Anderson thing, I think that the reason they say that Donald Trump won the debate is because Biden kept stumbling over his words, and Trump just bold face that lie with a straight face. <laughs> so my point is, no matter who wins the election in November, we're going to have a big liar in the White House. <laughs> my point is this. Do not put your trust in any politician Amen. or any political party. Yeah. Satan is in control of the whole world system. They are saying what they think you want to hear in order to put them in office. And just because they say it does not mean they're going to try to do it. And most of the time, it is not true. So no matter who wins the election in November, the winner is going to be Satan because both of them are operating on his team and the loser is who will put their trust in them. There is no hope in this world other than the Word of God. Amen. And in our society today, the Word of God is trampled on, is disrespected, and is cast aside. Let's go to Romans chapter number 8. The book of Romans. We're back in the New Testament now. Chapter number 8. And let's start looking at verse number 18. He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We have got more to look forward to than we have behind. And no matter what you're suffering and going through today, your future is better than your past. He said, for the earnest expectation of the creature eagerly awaits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in a hope. Because the creature itself also will be delivered from bondage of the correction into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What this is talking about, when Adam sinned, God did not just put the curse in Adam's life. He said, curse be the ground. The whole earth became cursed or under the curse when Adam fell. And the Bible says right now the earth is having birth pains wanting to get back to its original states. That's why when we look around in, in places like Washington and Oregon and New Jersey and, and, and Virginia and even in Florida lately, we see all these floods. Whole towns, whole neighborhoods being covered with floods. Hurricanes, hurricanes and tornadoes are being, are destroying homes and communities more and more in recent time than in the past. Amen. And when you look at the map, when they show it on TV, it looked like all of, all of uh, California going to burn up because they have so many wildfires that's going. Now, see, a lot of these things are natural disasters. The earth itself is showing signs of the end time, but nobody recognizes it. It used to be a time, a long time ago, when a natural disaster happened, the unbelievers would shake their fists at God and, and be angry with God, but now you know God is not even mentioned. I mean, when they were angry with God, at least they realized that there was a God. Now they don't mention nothing about God. They totally disallow him all together. All these natural disasters are nothing in comparison to what is going to happen before the end of time. Go to the book of 2 Peter. If not now, when? And if not us, then who? See, we have to learn to sound the trumpet. Warn the people because it's right here in the word of God. Go to 2 Peter, chapter number 3. And look at that verses uh, 3 and 4 together. I got more verses than that. But in verse number 3, it says... Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. See, we've been preaching, the church been preaching and teaching that Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. We've been saying that for over 2,000 years. And so people were saying, well, what's taking him so long? If he's coming back, why is he, why is he not here yet by now? And so they have the, 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 they look back and they think from the creation, things were just as they are now, they consider. But the Bible says, for this they willingly forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that was then perished being flooded with water. Noah preached and told them that the earth was going to be destroyed by water. He built a boat out there in the desert. And people should have known something was different. We all old animals coming to the boat. And so he was getting preparing. He was preparing for the flood. The unbelievers did not believe it. But their unbelief did not stop the flood from coming Amen. because God has said it. And when God said it, God is long suffering with us. God is patient with us. He gives us time to get things right. But if you don't do it, the word of God is going to come upon you quickly. Yeah. And unassumed. the Bible talk about how the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It will come without warning. The only warning you're going to have is those of us that are prepared if he come today. 
So if he come today, it ain't going to bother me. If he wait your next week, it won't bother me. 50 years from now, it won't bother me. I keep my suitcase packed. You got to have yours ready to go. Pull off this thing right here and ready to go and be with the Lord at any time. Stop putting it off. They talked about it, but the flood still came. It said, but the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and prediction of godly men. It's not going to be water. God promised that he would not destroy the earth with water again. Amen. But he did not say he was not going to destroy it. Now he's saying it's going to be with fire. Now, I don't know if, if, if getting caught in a fire storm is worse than drowning. I don't know. But either way, you're going to be gone, and either way, it's miserable. And so he told them, he letting us know now that this earth will be destroyed by fire. He says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. That's just simply telling you that time don't mean nothing to God. He was, here, he was here before the beginning and he'll be when everything is over. God will still be here. He'll still be existing. So a day with God don't mean anything compared to our time. Amen. So just because he's taking his time don't mean that he's not coming. Hallelujah. He said the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he longs suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he's not, quite, that's why he's not wiped us out. Amen. He's trying to give us time to get things in order. But one day, judgment is going to show up. Right now, we're under mercy. Right now, we're under grace. But one day, judgment is going to show back up again. He said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The thief don't warn anybody when he's coming. If he did, he's a poor thief. <laughs> the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Don't get earthbound. Don't get stuck on that car that you was blessed with. Don't be stuck on your houses. Don't be stuck on your clothes. Don't be stuck on your job. If you got a job where you ain't ever got time to, to come to any kind of church services, you about need to find you another job because you're too busy. Amen. Amen. In, uh, in the Bible study class on, on, on Friday night, somebody asked the question, do, is there anything that you put more value in than God? Is there anything that you trust more than God? And we're, and we're quick to say no, but is your job keeping you from worshiping God the way it's supposed to be? Do your money, do you, do you trust your job more than you trust God? Do you trust your money more than you trust God? Do you trust your husband or wife more than you trust God? What is it that you put your faith in? See? And so you have to, it's a close examination. It's a, you have to examine yourself and see why, why you didn't go to church Sunday. Whatever caused you from going to church on Sunday, if you weren't sick or out of town, you better check, examine yourself and see what you're worshiping. If you don't have time for worship, you ain't got time for God. Now, I ain't saying that, that, that coming to church is a requirement for being saved, but what I'm saying is a church is a requirement for you to grow in the Lord because the Bible said that God put in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the maturing of the saints. You can get saved, but if you're going to reach maturity, you got to go to the house of God because that's where God put it. That's where God anointed people. And see, it's not just hearing the pastor from the pulpit, but that praise team, it can get you off, it can get your mind off of what, was your, what you were worried about and what you were focused on and get your mind on God. 
When you walk in the door, when we got the right kind of usher, the way they greet you ought to make you feel wanted because we're stronger together. And everybody got a mission in the house of God. And everybody is important. We need each other. Amen. If you're going to grow, coming to the house of God is not a time wasted. It's time invested. Amen. Hallelujah. Then it says, now it told you what the heaven and earth is going to be uh, burned up, everything in it, the, the heaven, the earth, everything in it, and it talks about how it's going to be like a, uh, the elements, the stars, the moon, the sky, all that stuff is going to start crashing and coming down here and destroy the earth. But he don't want to leave you with a negative note. He says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for what? New heavens and a new earth which righteousness dwell. See, God going to get rid of the old, but he's going to present the new. I want to be here when he come back. I want to be in a new heaven. I want to be in a new earth. And I get excited when I talk about it because, see, the body that we have now is our earth suit. This body is designed for us to live on planet earth. When we die, those of us that are in Christ Jesus, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we leave out of this body and go immediately up to heaven. And if our earthly house or this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands eternally in heaven. So we leave this earth suit and put on a heaven suit. We have us a body designed to live in heaven. But that's not how the story ends. Because see, what's going to happen is that one day the trumpet is going to sound. And those that died in Christ are going to get up out of this body, this earth body, is going to get up out of the grave. And it's going to be changed from mortal to immortality. Hallelujah. It's going to be glory. It's going to be a glorified body. And the thing is, when our body from earth is being resurrected from the ground, we're going to come back with the Lord in our body from heaven and combine the earth suit with the heaven suit so that when you have a new heaven and a new earth, I can step right out of heaven and go in the earth. I can step right out of because Jesus, the body that he had, was designed and he could eat right here on earth, but then he got on the cloud and went right on up into heaven. Yeah. And there he lived forever. I'm looking forward to it. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. That old Negro spirit just say, ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Turn me around. Turn me around. Ain't going to let nobody turn me around because I'm going to the promised land. Hallelujah. I, I, I kind of feel jealous of some of these preachers that can preach and sing. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm excited about what we have in store. God loves us. But the only hope in this world is in Jesus Christ. The politicians don't have the answer. And nobody else on earth has the answer unless they're bringing you the word of God. Put your trust in him. The Bible says that today is a day of salvation. If you are not saved, stop putting it off. Amen. If, you are not, if you have not made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior in your life, stop putting it off. You don't have much time. You don't know how much time you have. You may live to be 120, but you may not live past the day. Right. See, and however you are, the condition that you are in, when Christ comes, that's the way you're going to answer him. Amen. Not that you intend, not how one day I plan to get saved. That's good to have a plan. But suppose you don't make it to that day. You need to know and know that you know that if you leave, if the rapture come right now, you'll be ready to go. If death come right now, you'll be ready to go. Hallelujah. Because your salvation is the most important thing that you got. I thank God for the house. I thank God for the car. I thank God for the clothes. I thank God for the money, but I don't love none of it. I use it. I use it for here and, for, and to glorify God with it. But everything come behind Jesus Christ. My salvation, I value more than anybody or anything else. And that's the attitude that we got to have. So if you put in your confidence in any man, put your confidence 
in the true and living God, the one who never lie, the one who always can, who cannot lie. Amen. And we know that every promise that God made is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. He is our hope. In this life, he is the only hope. We need you to make a decision today to make him Lord and Savior in your life. And if you are saved, make a decision to tell this word to somebody else and help somebody else get saved. Somebody had to witness to you. Somebody prayed for you. That's why you're here. So we don't just get saved just to be saved. We get saved to become workers on the field in the kingdom of God. Would you stand to your feet, please? Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you for the people that have come and heard your word. Do not think it robbery to come to the house of God and hear what you had to say for us. It's, your, it's you, Lord, that make our life better. Yes, Father. Hallelujah. You are our hope in this world and in the world to come. And no matter what we have to go through, Father God, it's worth it to be in the kingdom of God and see you face to face, making you our everlasting Father, the God of righteousness, and we will dwell with you in your home, which will be our home. Father God, we thank you. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory. Thank you for your word and thank you for every hero. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, take a bold step of faith. Amen. Sometimes it takes boldness to step out. My wife and I went to this church, and the preacher was preaching, and when he made the altar call, both of us were what you would call good people, but neither one of us was saved. We grew up in the church, and, but we really didn't know Jesus. And when the preacher made that altar call, she got up and left me sitting at my seat to go and put her faith and confidence in God. I was mad with her and the preacher. <laughs> but she got saved anyway. And so she held on, and it wasn't long before I came right behind her, just a, maybe a few days later, maybe a month or so later, I got saved too. I could see a difference in her life. And that's the way it is whenever you come to Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to see a difference other than you toting the Bible and having a cross around your neck. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not just that's not what justifies you as a Christian. It's your lifestyle. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. There should be a change in your life when you come to Christ Jesus. And he will change your life. If you come to him, and, and I'm gonna tell you, I think one of the most miserable things for somebody to come and make a confession and for Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior, and then they go back into what they came out, go back into the same old lifestyle. There is no peace in that. Because God has done something in your life that make you different. And the Bible says, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I'll be your God. And then you can be my people. He gives you the ability to make changes. But you got to renew your mind so you will make the changes. Amen. So if you give God a try, give him a chance. Uh, there was somebody say that come to the Lord and if, he, if you don't like it, the devil will always take you back. You can go back into that world if you want to. But, but you need to make a decision that I'm going to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior in my life. And we'll make it that altar call. Now, one prayer. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that he is Savior. The word of God got to be in two places. In your heart and out of mouth. And that produces salvation. So if that's you, we invite you to come. <laughs> If you are saved and you don't have a church home, we invite you to become a part of Evergreen Church Ministry. It's the easiest church I've ever seen to grow, because I mean to, to become a part of, because we don't vote you in, uh, we don't vote you out. If God sends you, we receive you. So if you're saved and you don't have a church home, you need a church home. This is, a, 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 this is an altar call. And if there's, we believe that God is a healing God, if you have a sickness in your body and you want to join faith with you about that, if you got any kind of situation that's going on in your life, we invite you to come up and we'll pray together. We'll join our faith with your faith because it changes things. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. It changes people. It changes circumstances. This is your opportunity. 
If you're watching us on Facebook or watching us on YouTube, we thank you for joining us. And we leave these words with you. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you. If you desire prayer, come on down and we'll join our faith with your